Good afternoon and welcome to today's installment of the 2022 January series. My name is Jewel Maidenblick and I'm privileged to serve as president of Calvin Theological Seminary. I start our time together, especially for those who are in this room with this request, would you please take a moment to silence your cell phones? Thank you. As you are doing so, I would like to welcome guests at all our 50 simulcast viewing locations, including Linden, Washington, Port St. Lucie, Florida, and Midland, Michigan. And all our virtual attendees across various time zones, we are grateful that you are joining us today. Today's presentation is also the Stab Lecture. The Stab Lecture is sponsored annually by Kelvin University and Kelvin Theological Seminary to honor Dr. Henry Staub, who served so well as a professor at both institutions. Dr. Staub taught from 1939 until 1975, except for the years when he served in the armed forces as a lieutenant in the United States Navy during World War II. The Staub Lecture is funded by the Henry Staub Endowment, and we again express our appreciation to the family of Dr. Staub for their continued support and encouragement for these lectures. The president of Kelvin University, Michael Arroyo, and myself as president of Kelvin Seminary, would like to also thank a committee that helps us recognize Dr. Staub's contribution to the church and the kingdom of God, and invites continued conversations in the field of ethics, apologetics, and philosophical theology. Would you join me in prayer for this presentation as well as the journey that we have been on in the January series of 2022? Please join me in prayer. Dear Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence with us. Thank you for the technology that once again allows us to connect through the miles, through the different places and locations and people. Thank you for those who've served once again to present such a wonderful array of conversations and people who once again help us listen and discern our times. We pray for once again this day and for what we may face in it. For the pain in this world, we pray again for hope and healing for the Omicron and COVID rates that still fluctuate and sometimes arise, we again ask that you be with those on the front lines of those conversations and also processes of healing. But we again are grateful once again for your presence with us as we take note of this wonderful world that you've created and that you still so love. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. And now Dr. Kareen Mogg, Director of the Henry Meter Center for Kelvin Studies will introduce our guests. Good afternoon. As Jewel Middenblick said, my name is Karin Mogg. I am the director of the Meter Center for Kelvin Studies at Calvin University. It is my great pleasure to announce today's January series speaker, Dr. Sujin Pak. She currently serves as Professor of the History of Christianity and Dean of the School of Theology at Boston University. Before coming to Boston in 2021, she taught at Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary and then at Duke University in Church History, while also taking on academic leadership responsibilities including Associate Dean of Academic Programs and then Vice President for Academic Affairs. Above all, Dr. Pak is an engaging and talented historian, focusing on how the Bible, and the Old Testament in particular, has been understood among past generations of Christian interpreters, especially in the Reformation period. Her publications include two major studies in this field, Judaizing Calvin, 16th Century Debates over the Messianic Psalms, 2009, and The Reformation of Prophecy, Early Modern Interpretations of the Prophet and Old Testament Prophecy, 2018, both published by Oxford University Press. For those who would like to meet her in person, Dr. Pak will be available to greet audience members in the West Lobby of the Covenant Fine Arts Center following this presentation. I have long admired her clear and cogent thinking, and I am deeply looking forward to her presentation to us today, titled, Wrestling with the Word, Biblical Interpretation Through Church History. Calvin University is grateful to the Staub Lecture Series for underwriting today's presentation, 
Please welcome Sujin Pak. It is indeed an honor to be here with you today. And I'm grateful to Director Christy Potter for the invitation to be here, to President Maidenblick for his gracious hosting and hospitality, and to the faculty of Calvin Theological Seminary for recommending me. It's also a privilege to give the lecture in honor of Dr. Henry Staub. You've heard a little bit of my biography. Let me give you a little bit more. I am a missionary kid. I'm also biracial. My father is a Korean man who is a professor of worship and an ordained United Methodist pastor. And my mother was a white woman from upstate New York who audaciously went to Korea as a single missionary and met my father there. So I grew up in this missionary community. And I was, even though I have deep background and heritage as a United Methodist on both sides of my family with many, many, many pastors and deacons and district superintendents, I was taught in this missionary community primarily by Southern Baptists. And one of the great gifts the Southern Baptists gave me was a deep love of scripture, which I carry with me to this day. It has journeyed me through times of intellectual curiosity, crises of faith, scholarly endeavors, and times of disillusionment as well. So today I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the history of biblical interpretation, the practices of how the Bible is read over time, and I'm gonna to try to talk to you as both a scholar and as a person of faith. And so I'm going to try to think about how I integrate this learning with what you know, ways we might learn how to approach scripture. So wrestling with the word. Pinning down what scripture is or how to interpret faithfully can be as elusive as the identity of the stranger with whom Jacob wrestled by the Jabbok River. You might recall that the younger brother Jacob tricks his aging father Isaac by posing as his eldest brother Esau to steal his blessing. In despair, Esau swears to kill Jacob once his father has died. So Jacob flees. He flees to the family of his mother, marries the daughters of his uncle Laban, and starts to amass great wealth. And then what happens? Well, the sons of Laban are quite jealous of him and he finds himself having to flee once again fleeing exactly back to the brother he betrayed. On the banks of the Jabbok, the night before he was to meet this wronged brother, Jacob finds himself between fear and promise, the fear of a brother's rightful wrath and the promise God gave him in a dream at Bethel that his heritage would be secure. His fear is crushing. Notice in the text, he sends lavish gifts ahead to try to appease Esau, and he lines up his family in a distinctive order, putting his favorite light, wife last in the order. Yet all the while, he's holding on to fragile hope. In the dark of the night, Jacob wakes alone on the other side of the river, and he wrestles with this mysterious stranger until daybreak. As they wrestle, the stranger strikes his hip and dislocates it. And when dawn approaches, the stranger tries to leave, and Jacob won't let him go refusing and saying, I will not let you go until you bless me. In response, the stranger gives him a new name. You shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and humanity and have prevailed. Jacob greets the dawn of a new day with a new name, a new blessing, and a limp. Why have I chosen this text as an allusion for this talk? You see, early Christian readers have long recognized that scripture often offers stories that help illuminate the task of biblical interpretation itself. Scripture provides cues to its own reading. In approaching the interpretive task, we also might find ourselves in a place of fear and promise. Fear of whether we'll land on the right interpretation. Fear of whether God will show up or not. Fear of whether the text has anything to say that's relevant. Fear that whether we can evoke a good word or sermon from it. Fear that's brought on by the uses of this text across history to oppress, dominate. Yet, we are also tugged by the promise of encountering the divine in some way. The prospect that this text might convey wisdom, discernment, hope, peace, comfort, liberation. So who is this mysterious stranger? Some say that Jacob wrestled with himself in the dark night of a soul. Others say he wrestled with an angel. And still others suggest that he wrestled with Esau himself. 
Many point to the mysterious figure as divine. Jacob wrestles with God. Jacob wrestles with Christ. The text itself points to this possibility, for it says, when he named the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face. Pre-modern Christian readers particularly found exegetical richness in identifying the stranger with Christ, Christ the Word made flesh. In other words, Jacob wrestles with the Word in fear and in hope. And in the wrestling, he glimpses the face of God and is transformed in the process. He receives a new name, a blessing, and part of him is put out of joint. Jacob cannot walk in the world the same way ever again. In encountering the divine world, he will see and experience things in a wholly new way, with blessing, new identity, and a constant reminder of dislocation. So hold on to these points, because I'm going to return to those at the end. Yet there is more. Jacob, in receiving the name Israel, becomes a type of Israel. In other words, he becomes a figure of the people of God. And for Christians, that would mean he becomes a figure of the church. So then as the figure of the church, Jacob then also serves as a figure of Christ because Christ is, the body of Christ is the church, right? So Jacob then signifies as well the church's wrestling with God as a figure of the church. And as a figure of the body of Christ, he then also becomes a figure of Christ himself, of Christ wrestling with God. Indeed, pre-modern Christian readers drew upon these typological connections between Jacob at the Jabbok and Christ at Gethsemane, in which Christ also clings to God and refuses to let go. Brent Latham points to, out, points to this finding of, of finding Christ on both sides of the wrestling match that enable us, us to grasp a key truth. He says this, the story is participatory. It isn't just that we struggle with God as Israel or look at God's face. It is also that Emmanuel enters the story on our side and draws us to himself. This invitation to participate in the biblical narrative rings true across history. So take, for example, African-American engagements with the story of Jacob. You can see it in the slave spirituals, wrestle on Jacob, or the second verse of, I saw the beam in my sister's eye. Indeed, in the souls of black folk, W.E.B. Du Bois points to the black slave's identification with Jacob's wrestling as one who wrestles with God for the, his people and refuses to let go until Jesus bless my soul. One interpreter points out, African-American readers imitate Jacob by simultaneously embracing faith and defiance, submission and resistance. You think of the push and pull of wrestling rather than disassociating these from one another. The biblical scholar Phyllis Tribble describes the power of this text in her own life. You see, Tribble found herself caught between justified feminist criticisms of the Bible's patriarchy and her deep love for the Bible. To many, she writes, to know that one is a feminist and to know that one loves the Bible, to many, that's an oxymoron. It will not work. After all, if no man can serve two masters, then no woman can serve two authorities, a master called scripture and a mistress called feminism. If this rhetoric of impossibility be true, writes Tribble, then I of most all women was most wretched. Yet, Tribble reveals the Bible itself, the Bible itself came to her aid, precisely in this text of Jacob's wrestling. In Jacob's declaration of saying, I will not let go until you bless me, she found a transformative pathway. Tribble exclaims, that declaration became my challenge to the Bible from the perspective of feminism. I will not let go of this book until it blesses me. I will struggle with it. I will not turn it over to my enemies to curse me. Neither shall I turn it over to my friends who wish to curse it. No, I shall hold fast for a blessing. Yet she adds, but I'm under no illusion that the blessing will come on my own terms, that I, that I will not be changed in the process. For after all, Jacob, the blessed man, limped away. Jacob, poised between threat and promise, wrestles with a stranger. And even this small snapshot that I've given you, basically a history of interpretation of this text, we can draw some really important insights. First, 
there are multiple valid readings, not just one single right reading. This text that maybe we need not approach the Bible or scripture with the fear of arriving at, arriving at the right interpretation. Second, interpretation is participatory. The biblical text invites the reader into its story. The biblical text also welcomes your own story in the act of reading. It invites interpretive exchange. Yet it does not end there. And that it does not simply confirm or reaffirm our identities or our own self-understanding. Rather, just as Calvin so eloquently states, Scripture can serve as spectacles by which we might read and see our world. And therefore, it's not just that we make the, the Scripture speak about us. It actually gives us a new way of seeing. This then leads to a third key insight. The task of biblical interpretation aspires to be transformational. There's the hope of encountering the divine and that some life-changing, life changing life life-giving thing might happen. So in this journey of invitation, participation, exchange, and transformation, there is this space for an attention of push and pull, wrestling, even resistance. I mean, I often think that we don't look enough at the Bible, at these texts where the patriarchs and matriarchs like hold their fists to God, like, you know, and really argue with God. There's, there's room for that kind of wrestling. And the aim is really not the knowledge gained or the moral lessons that you might pull from it. The aim is the journey itself. Moreover, in Christians engaging with scripture read not just as individuals, readings are communal. Attending to histories of biblical interpretation makes this immediately evident. We're invited into a community of readers across time where we might hear things we might otherwise have forgotten and see things we might otherwise not have seen. It even enables us to wrestle with and reimagine received traditions. So I'm going to turn now to reflect on some of the gifts of the history of biblical interpretation that have blessed me as a scholar and as a person of faith. I'm going to start by laying out some assumptions I think we inherit from um, from where, you know, where we are in this point in history. And then I'm going to offer some alternatives to those assumptions, some alternative ways of thinking about things I think a broader view of history of interpretation might offer us. So, the first assumption. The first assumption that I think we may, may not even consciously operate with is that there's an assumption that there's only one right way to read the Bible, or even one right reading. And this potentially damaging assumption often comes from the histor applying historical critical methods to the Bible. You see, historical criticism asserted that the text historical literal reading is the starting point or the most important reading that then bounds any other possible reading. Historical critical methods arose out of the Enlightenment, and it arose out of Enlightenment's emphasis on empirical, rational, and scientific methodologies. In other words, the veracity of a conclusion was then measured by its adherence to reason, correlation with tested experience, and agreement with historical sources. Thus, when it came to the Bible, historical criticism dictated that one must start with the text's original historical setting and the original author's intention to get at the original correct intended meaning. Yet, such assumptions actually limit the possible meanings of the text, shackling it to the historical sense and its adherence basically to external sources to, to, um, to determine and divulge its truth. So in effect, historical critical methods placed reason, empirical knowledge, and history as equal, if not in some ways superior, authorities in ascertaining and verifying scripture's truth. Consequently, by the way, if you think, think this through, supernatural possibilities, such as divine revelation, were increasingly eclipsed and sometimes outright rejected. Not surprisingly then, such an eclipse or outright rejection of divine, or divine revelation then acutely challenged traditional understandings of scripture's authority. Contrary to rooting scripture's authority in a source as divine revelation, because now the concept of divine revelation is called into question, historical criticism shifted the authority of text to their adherence to rational, empirical, and historical evidence. So responses to this. One response, of course, was to reject divine revelation altogether and thus to reject scripture's unquestioned universal authority. 
others responded by placing every part of scripture to the tests of reason, empirical evidence, and history, thereby essentially creating a piecemeal form of authority. Now, many Christians responded by reasserting divine, you know, the scripture's authority, and something some like neo-Orthodox uh, thinkers at this time reaffirmed the concept of divine revelation, which is um, you know, a very logical response. Others Christ Christians responded by doubling down on the principle of scripture's inerrancy by asserting scripture's literal, historical, and empirical inerrancy. In this way, affirming scripture's authority became equivalent to affirming its historical facticity and empirical accuracy. Now, we might note, however, that this account of scripture's authority essentially buys into the whole program of historical criticism and its assertions that a source's authority is determined by its adherence to reason, history, empirical evidence. Right, hold on to that, and I'm, I'm, now I'm gonna try to paint like what else is going on, what, what kind of paved the way to this. So let's take a step back. Historical criticism's emphases did not come out of a vacuum, of course. They emerged from developments in enlightenment and um, the scientific revolution. They also emerged within precedents of Christian history itself. For example, and I, this, is, this is my work, uh, 16th century reformers. The 16th century Protestant reformers sharply criticized the shift in the medieval church to increasingly locate biblical interpretation solely in the hands of, of church leaders, making then the reader, reading of scripture a privilege of the elite and placing it potentially in service of church authority rather than, say, God's authority. So in response, the Protestant reformers, such as Luther, Zwingli, and Calvin, insisted upon the primacy of scripture's authority over and above the authority of the church. And against that perceived elitism, they asserted the concept of the priest of all believers, that every Christian, by right of baptism, has the call and ability they need to read scripture rightly. They also asserted a principle that scripture is clear and accessible. So methodologically, this makes sense, right? Such, such assertions of scripture's clarity, perspicuity, and accessibility reinforce then an emphasis on scripture's plain literal sense. They argued that this plain literal sense is known through scripture itself, where clearer passages of scripture help illuminate maybe those passages that are more obscure. And they also argued, by the way, and this is something not to forget, um, they argued for the profound necessity of the guide and intervention of the Holy Spirit, and that the Spirit was given to every believer at baptism. Yet, alongside these things of like reinserting Scripture's authority and the emphasis on Holy Spirit, the other thing that the reformers did at this time was to emphasize authorial intention, original authorial intention, and the original historical sense as really clear gateways to understanding this plain literal sense. Another step of this, another emphasis, you know, in, an emphasis on scripture's plain literal sense, and in, re, in rejecting what, what the reformers perceived as the church's tyranny over scripture at that time, they also re, staunchly rejected allegorical readings of scripture. The medieval, medieval church's practices had indeed become quite um, robust in their allegorical readings of scripture. But the reformers looked at that and said it had now become so unmoored from this plain literal sense that you're supposed to really highlight. And they criticized that reading of scripture had become this kind of game of the elite, this kind of scholarly game, um, and which also then made scripture even more distant from the, the, just the true Christian believer when, in fact, when the priesthood of all believers, they should also be able to read. Now, before I go on, just please do not mishear me. There are some subtle criticisms of maybe rise of historical criticism and things, but in fact, I don't mean to say that. On the contrary, I think every era, as I look at the history of biblical interpretation, every era of history of biblical interpretation offers potentially gifts and potential challenges. And, and then when you dig more deeply, you realize in every era, they're also trying to respond to the challenges of their time as best they can. So let me summarize where I am right now. Modern Christians, I would argue, in one way or another, kind of struggle or wrestle with a set of assumptions. The assumption that 
the, any right reading of scripture must prioritize the original setting of the text, the original historical sense, and the original author's intention. And the assumption that the literal sense is, is exactly identical to this historical sense. Stemming from this, then, there's also this assumption that all allegorical or figural reading is bad and which to be avoided. And what I'm gonna, where I'm going to go from there is actually to try to show you that in the wider history of biblical interpretation, the church teaches a profound tie between the literal sense and the spiritual sense rather than them being diametrically opposed. And lastly, there's this assumption that um, if you uphold scripture's authority, you must necessarily uphold its historical and empirical accuracy or facticity. And I'm gonna show you from the history of interpretation that there are possible broader possibilities there. And lastly, just in the Enlightenment's defense, one of the things Enlightenment thinkers were trying to do in going back to reason and empiricism and history as kind of the ways to understand things, they were trying to appeal to natural, universally accessible sources of authority. And in doing so, they thought maybe they could free the world from prejudice. And they thought maybe they could, um, you know, remember this is also the time of the religious wars, that this might be a good answer to the kind of religious wars that were going on. Yet, ironically, by the way, you might note, if you know your wider history, it's not just religion and the Bible that have been used to, as weapons of prejudice or violence. Science itself was also used in that way um, in the Holocaust. It was also used that way to undergird theories of racial superiority. Well, anyway, this well-intended goal of Enlightenment thinkers to make, have this appeal to this universally accessible thing often undergirds then an assumption that um, we're supposed to strive for neutral universal readings. And here, our modern context teaches us a lot about the importance of how we're very socially located and making sure we're aware of that. So let me turn to some alternatives I think history of open interpretation offers to this set of assumptions. The question of when and how to attend to the historical sense of scripture is a hotly debated topic across church history. And there's not enough time to review all of what's going on there. But I'm gonna say just, what I'll say briefly is this. First, attention to scripture's historical sense has always been an important aspect of Christian readings of scripture because Christianity is a faith that has deep commitments to certain key historical events, right? And second, while Christians have long affirmed the importance of Scripture's literal sense, broader Christian history demonstrates that this literal sense is not identified solely with the historical sense, nor is it identified solely with the original author's intention. Furthermore, prioritizing this historical sense doesn't necessarily lead to the conclusion that you only read one way. Christians have long held that there's multiple ways and faithful ways to read and multiple senses. So in the start, in the early church, you see there's two senses of scripture. No brainer, letter and spirit. It comes from 2 Corinthians 3.6. But around the fifth sense, fifth and sixth centuries, we see the emergence of these two senses expanding into four, which then becomes that medieval fourfold sense, also known as the quadriga. So this medieval fourfold sense has, of course, the literal sense, which is often the literal historical sense. And then the spiritual sense is divided up into three senses that align with the cardinal virtues of the Christian faith. That means those virtues are faith, love, and hope. So these three senses. The allegorical sense aligns with the virtue of faith, where you ask the text, what does this text teach me to believe? The tropological or moral sense of the text aligns with the virtue of love, where you ask, how does this text instruct me, instruct me to act lovingly and morally? And the third sense, spiritual sense, aligns with the virtue of hope, which asks, in what does this text teach me to hope? Or hope meaning sort of an eschological vision, right? In what, in what am I tending towards? What is my telos? The medieval fourfold sense expressed then scripture's multivocality and nuanced understandings of its literal sense as well. So yes, the literal sense could be this historical sense, absolutely, 
but it might also just simply be what the words say. And, and mind you, think about that. That's actually different. It can be different from a strictly little thing, what the words actually say. And where you attend to the actual sequence of the words and where it appears in the text, etc., to constitute a literal sense. And in doing so, these early church interpreters, these pre-modern interpreters, saw a profound tie between the literal and spiritual sense. So for example, Origen wrote this. Whenever things that have been done in history could be harmonized with the spiritual meaning, one finds a single narrative comprising of both the literal and, and spiritual meanings. In other words, there can be a time when it's just, sing, it is, there can be singular, like this is the history, historical sense says what we need to, to know. But he argues there are times when that's not the case. Sometimes he says there's times when they're not in harmony. Even then, he'll point to this literal sense as the doorway to understanding what kind of spiritual sense to pursue. So what does he mean here? He'll argue sometimes in the text, the historical order of the narrative is interrupted or broken. In those cases, he says, if you see something kind of weird going on or it doesn't make sense or there's like dis discrepancies, he'll say like, that doesn't, that's not a mistake in the Bible. That's actually intentionally put there to lead you to ask further questions about what's going on and to seek the spiritual meaning of the text. He says also these disruptions might look like inconsistencies or seeming inconsistency if you want to call it that. It might also look like what about text that in their literal sense renders a meaning that's immoral or a meaning that's unworthy of God. So what Origen argues is again that's intentionally he has a very robust concept of divine revelation and, and authority of scripture. He says that's intentionally put there by the divine author to wake up the reader to read further and more deeply into the text and to see what spiritual sense might be there. And so he maintains this deep inextricable tie between the literal and spiritual senses. Let me give you an example. So take a really hard text, the conquest of Canaan and like Joshua and Judges. If you read the literal sense of that text, God in that text uh, directly commands genocide. What do you do with this text? Origen argues that, you know, this, you, when you take that literal kind of reading and it stops you in your tracks with this kind of command, that you must seek a deeper meaning, that, that, that that's, you know, when it's in, in, not something consistent with God. Now, you may not be convinced by Origen's answer to this, um, Origen argues for a spiritualized reading. So he goes on to say, you know, this is not a literal thing anyone should ever do, but actually you're supposed to slay the sin in your life or you're supposed to look and slay the sin in unjust systems. Um, you may or may not be happy with that or convinced, and yet at the same time, you can see the, the, the call for the need to read and figure out what is really going on with this text beyond simply a plain literal reading. So going back to this deep tie, that's one example. Another person gives an example of how this deep tie of the literal and spiritual senses operated within the broader history of the church. Think of, I look to Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas. He articulated an already popular rule, he just articulated even more clearly, that all the senses of scripture are founded on the literal sense. So it's like the foundation, the grounding of things. And therefore, any argument that's going to be drawn from scripture needs to be drawn from the literal sense first and foremost. He explained nothing necessary in scripture, or, or sorry, nothing necessary for faith is contained under a spiritual sense. It's all that everything, anything necessary for, for faith is already there in the clear, plain, literal sense. And he goes on to argue then, and if that's true, then the literal sense anchors all other reading. It anchors spiritual reading, it anchors allegorical reading, it anchors um, figural readings. And so you might note how this principle allows both for the possibility of allegorical reading with some proper anchoring and boundaries and guidelines, and also then, you know, anchors it. So, summarizing again where we are, the history of biblical interpretation offers a literal sense that can be defined as a historical literal sense, but it also offers a literal sense that can be defined simply as what the words say, because that might not simply be a, a historical sense. And they also argue for this deep tie between the literal and spiritual senses of the text. 
There's more. Pre-modern readings of scripture also maintain that the literal sense of scripture can be a figural reading. Now we're like doing mind gymnastics. By figural reading, what do I mean? I point to the fact that words act as signs, right? A word can be a sign. It can be the thing, that, what it says in itself, but it also can be a sign that points to other persons, to other events, to other things and meanings, like it's a, it's a principle of analogy. So while often a figural reading might be a spiritual reading, it's not necessarily so. Take an example like this. In the 14th century, there's a figure, Nicholas of Lyra, who proposed a double literal sense, a double literal sense. So the, there's a literal historical sense and a literal prophetic. Now, this, this, is, um, this is an interesting concept. So what, is he, what does he mean? Of course, the literal historical is what we've talked about, but literal prophetic pertains particularly to Old Testament texts that prefigure Christ. Maybe specifically, you know, one's New Testament text that draw an Old Testament text from the Old, and, and prophesy Christ. So, but what that really, what he's saying is that the literal sense is both the historical or what the original author intended or what's, you know, or the plain sense. And the literal sense are those prophecies of Christ. That's the literal sense of the text. Take, for example, pre-modern readings of Psalm 22. My, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, of course, the literal sense of Psalm 22 is David's psalm that he writes when he's fleeing persecution from King Saul. But the early church will go on to say that's one of the literal senses. And the next literal sense is that it literally is Jesus's prayer on the cross. In other words, it's not that Jesus has said that first line of the psalm. They, they're really envisioning that Jesus prayed through that whole psalm, and it's literally his prayer on the cross. So that it literally pertains to David, and it literally pertains to Christ. And there's more. Since David is also a figure of the church, according to pre-modern thinkers, then David, in praying as the embodying the church, also then offers a prayer for the church in their times of suffering, whether as an individual Christian or as a community. In this way, pre-modern interpreter definitions of the literal sense of span beyond simply identifying it with a historical sense and beyond the original author's intention. Let me talk a little bit about, um, of, about biblical authority. So what alternatives does history of interpretation offer? First of all, it offers that biblical authority does not necessarily have to be tied to affirmations or of the Bible's historical facticity. Rather, they return to this conviction of Scripture as divine revelation. Though such sources can verify or, or may very well, or it's not to say that it's not historically accurate. They may very well be historically accurate. It's not tied to that is what their point is. Scripture is not obligated to align itself to these things. In other words, Scripture can say something that is true outside of the confinement of historical facticity. Now, I realize this is a hotly contested, um, it's hotly contested in Christian history about this question of historical facticity because, let's be clear, the historical facticity of, say, for example, Christ's life, um, birth, life, ministry, death, resurrection, and, and ascension are non-negotiables for many Christians. So insisting that some of the Bible is historically factual while others might not necessarily have to be for it still to be an authoritative scripture begs the question, of course, about how do we decide? How do you decide which parts are historical fact and which are not? And indeed, Origen, if you know more about Origen, his willingness to play very loosey-goosey with history was not something even his fellow uh, interpreters were exactly happy with. Yet, the point is this. Pre-modern thinkers did not root Scripture's authority in its historical facticity. In fact, they'll argue we go back to that principle, that sometimes there are discrepancies and they're intentionally put there by God to point to possibilities of needing to read more deeply in, in additional layers of meaning. So, some might find turning to a concept of divine revelation, like returning to that, not so helpful. Um, yet pre-modern readers recognize, basically, there's no getting around the fact that belief in Scripture's authority is ultimately and perhaps inescapably an act of faith. 
Either you take the leap or you don't. And in taking the leap, you invite the possibility of encounter with a text that is like no other text. You invite, the text becomes a kind of I-thou in which you might encounter the divine. And yes, there are many good ways to read scripture or read the Bible without affirming its authority. Yet I would argue the purposes of reading become quite different between those who read the Bible as any other text and those who see it as a sacred text and give it some form of authority. As any other text, you might read it for knowledge and moral, ethical guidelines. As a sacred text, you read for more than that. You read for it a hope of, of meeting God, a divine encounter that might be transformative. Concerning this question of biblical authority, the history of biblical interpretation also offers something more than just simply affirming a concept of divine revelation. In fact, the history shows that identifying scripture with divine revelation does not necessarily generate an absolute, even affirmation of the authority of the so-called material biblical text. And what am I saying here? Again, they go back to draw on this text in 2 Corinthians 3, 6. The letter kills, but the spirit gives life. In that, they teach about the necessary, the absolutely necessary presence of the Holy Spirit for the letter of the Bible to become a life-giving word. For example, Calvin himself kind of points to this concept. He argued that script, for scripture to be the true efficacious word of God, its bond with the spirit has to be upheld. Any who read without the spirit might very well only have a dead letter, indeed possibly a death-dealing letter, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. And Karl Barth, if, you, if you're a Barth scholar, you know this, takes up a similar theme writing, the Bible is God's word so far as God lets it be God's word, so far as God speaks through it. Thus, Barth points to the Bible becoming the word of God. Consequently, the Bible's authority to, to Barth is not authority of the text itself per se, it's the authority of God who chooses to show up and speak through the biblical witness of, the, of, the, of, of Scripture. Indeed, this gives Bart a way to account for human abuses of the text. But you might be left with this question, how do we know when God shows up? And I'm going to get to that. So I'm briefly going to go to sort of thinking about this contextual reading of, of Scripture. You know, when Simons writes this in his groundbreaking article, The Superiority of Precritical Exegesis, he says this, meaning involves a listener as well as a speaker. The meaning of historical texts cannot be separated from their history of interpretation, and the notion that it means only what the author intended is actually naive, he argues. In this, he calls attention to the fact that it's always been the case that we bring our context to our reading. This recognition of contextual locations is really uh, something that I think we are, see very clearly in modern emphases or postmodern emphases, you know, such as black readings or Asian American readings of scripture, feminist readings, womanist readings. And, it, and I think it actually names something that's always been true. Everyone reads from a location. Augustine reads from a location. Aquinas reads from a location. All readings are contextual. All reading is shaped by the locations and no reading is neutral. So the text itself is not static, especially if we think of the text as a living being, some way in which God might livingly show up. And the reader is not static. And so it caused him to question then the striving for, say, universal neutral readings. And it caused him to question whether such neutral readings are even possible. And too often, well-intended acts of seeking this neutral universal reading, actually have contributed to using the text as a weapon. If I can make the text speak universally for all, then I can make it to force other people to conform. Yet if the text, if all reading is contextually located, then ultimately we cannot escape ourselves, our own sinfulness that, that we bring to the text, right? And we cannot escape everything, everything that we bring to the text. This might then draw, call into question too easily gotten normative claims that we might try to bring out of the text. And so I want to argue for this need for transparency about that and the need for self-interrogating practices, which I'll get to. But you might ask here at this point, 
Well, if we focus on this sort of social locatedness, this kind of ways in which we bring our context to the text, et cetera, and maybe that calls into question, you know, does it mean that in fact, if we can't make normative claims, we've just basically given up on the authority of scripture? I mean, that's the struggle, frankly. Many contextual readers today, that's exactly the path they've taken. And you might understand why, but I would argue that's not the only possibility. For me, in understanding engaging scripture as an act of encounter, alongside robust self-interrogating practice, there's our hopeful possibilities. In other words, you might think scripture is not an object, not an object to be wielded, but reimagine scripture as a subject, an I thou. And when it's turned into a subject, then you, know, you have room for wrestling and argument and exchange. You have room for a blessing rather than a curse. One of the greatest gifts of the history of interpretation for me then is this reorientation it gives to what we're actually doing when we read scripture. I think the big gift is it's about Christian formation. Augustine describes scripture as the vehicle provided by God to journey us back home. It's the vehicle to bring us back to God's original intended blessedness. That Christ, both as the incarnation and Christ as word, is the very vehicle of that journey. And thus, the incarnation is that vehicle and scripture is that vehicle to journey us back to God. And Augustine goes on to have this principle of you know, how do you know a good reading? Because it builds up love of God and love of neighbor. How do you know a good reading? He says, because it bears the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, goodness, faith, gentleness, self-control. How do you know a good reading? Augustine says, because you ask these questions, does that reading seek God? Does that reading recognize sin? Does that reading hunger for justice? Does it seek mercy? Does it not only promote love of God and love of neighbor, but does it promote love of enemies? Does it embody wisdom? I only have a few more minutes here, so I'll try to wrap this up. But I also have to name this. There are many who've experienced scripture itself as harmful. Not only an object that others have wielded as a weapon, but actually in scripture's plain literal sense has found it harmful. You can think of 1 Corinthians 14, 34, women should be silent as a text that has silenced women. And so that means for some, this is not just, you know, like if you think of scripture reading as an encounter, it's not an encounter with a trustworthy God. It might be a, 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 an encounter with a, a feeling like it's an untrustworthy God. And so I return to this image of Jacob wrestling with the stranger. The stranger is cloaked in mystery. And while God may be our friend, God may, or for some, seemingly our enemy, God is always, always other, evading our full comprehension. And, it's, and it also calls to not only wrestle with a strange God who we always need to remember as other and then therefore this ability of God for to surprise us. It's also a call to wrestle with a stranger among us. You might note that in Genesis 32, it explicitly says Jacob wrestled with God and humanity. And so it is a communal exercise. I think here of Calvin's ad admonition that no one person has enough knowledge to read scripture rightly. Calvin, in his preface to Romans, argues God intentionally asked us to read together as a community because we need each other to see what we can't see and to see what we are assuming and, um, and, and therefore to hear the words of others. And therefore we need these self-interrogating practices to cultivate hum humility, healthy self-knowledge, to see the image of God in this someone who is strange to us or completely other. And in doing so, I would argue we become even more Christian. Lastly, this image of wrestling invites a possibility of faithful resistance, of faithful questioning, of faithful both you know, resistance and submission. And that remember what Jacob was doing in wrestling. We not only seek our own blessing, we're seeking blessedness more broadly and to be a blessing to other. And in this image of dislocation, going back to the very start, where Jacob then also has his hip dislocated. I think this points to a call 
to wrestle with others and to remind that even sometimes that stranger's touch, that stranger's presence, is the very dislocation we need to remind us to faithfulness, to remind us to humility, to remind us to compassion. For without such Christ-like dislocations, Christians will continue to succumb to the temptations to wield arrogant, oppressive, and self-protective readings, and thus fall short of the very blessing God intended, as well as fall very short of the very call to be a blessing in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so you're a Methodist who loves John Calvin. That's right. <laughs> we, we're loving it. We're loving it. When, when you met with the class earlier, you reminded us that John Calvin was a refugee. How did his experience as a refugee impact how he interpreted Scripture? Great question. I think, you know, you just kind of start where I ended there. I think the sense of the dislocatedness that we might need I, I find Calvin to be a very human person, which I, maybe is one of the reasons I love him. He's very aware that he has ten, temptations to arrogance. He's that guy <laughs> that knows he's the smartest person in the room. <laughs> and so, you know, and so I, but he's very aware of that because he is also completely um, concerned about holiness. Yes. And so, you know, I think that reminder of that dislocation reminded him, him that he's always, you know, we as Christians in the world, we're always like not, this is not our home right? And yet it also reminds him of the compassion to have for people who have that feeling of, you know, of uh, insecurity. And so there's that both end of the call to, you know, compassion and humility, which he also, he knew he needed that call to humility, as, as well as the sort of larger es eschatological vision. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Um, so your own experiences as a, a biracial, bicultural, um, and I'm guessing you're able to read scripture through the lenses, lots of different lenses. Um, when you think about reading scripture as an American versus reading scripture as a Korean or cultures that tend to be more individualistic versus cultures that yeah, tend to be more yeah. communal, uh, how does that affect interpretations and everything from preaching to teaching to the rearing of people to love scripture? How does that impact? Uh, thank you. That's, you know, I mean, I... I tend, you may hear in that talk and, and lots of things I say, there's a, I tend to be a both-and person um, because I identify as a both-and. And, and, and so if I were to be transparent about my own social locatedness, obviously I bring that to me. Um, and you're exactly right, this kind of contrast between individualism and communal, I think is really powerful because it's, you know, it's not that you need, that you want to say one's better than the other, you need both. I mean, and so... Um, I, I think that's one of the reasons I think it's really important to listen to contextual readings and recognize every contextual reading is, is, is every reading is contextual, including the ones from church history, Augustine, Luther, Calvin. And then when you see that, it invites a sort of um, profound sense of communal reading together, not just with my community as an, a Korean or an American, but a communal reading across all of history, reading, you know, we're, 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 if we believe in the church, we're people of, of both the past and the present, right? The living and the dead. And, and so that larger commun community reading and broadening the possibilities of that communal seeing and thinking and giving us insight into parts, I mean, history is, is such that we get myopic and we forget, like one thing we might've forgotten, like is what is asceticism? And if we go back and really look at the church's history and learn about those kinds of practices. So I, yes, the communal element to me is just profoundly then kind of speaks into being intercultural and how to be an intercultural minister or intercultural leader and, and, and equips you and equips you with the pastoral care skills to listen to somebody different from you and to put yourself into their situation and therefore really you know, listen with deep compassion. And, and then it doesn't mean that you forget the individual element. You need to have that individual care of the soul. You need to have that sort of personal connection with God. I mean, I admit, I had a season of, of incredible struggle in my life where um, God really wanted to teach me the communal element of, mm. of spiritual life. 
And so I felt like I, God was just quiet and silent and, I, and like my personal life was just dying. And yet I realized I was supposed, anyway, so just learning, but then recapturing the gift of that personal life now with the balance of the importance of community was a, another a kind of both and that I learned in my own life. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. As a, um, a theological educator, um, one of our challenges is that scripture is messy, right? Put, put the talk in one sentence, scripture is messy. Interpreting it is hard. Uh, and how do we get students to delight in the messiness when so many of us have been reared in denominational or ecclesiastical contexts where we want to have the right answer and the fear of not getting it, you talked about fear and promise, the fear of not having the right answer we find kind of paralyzing and makes us think, I don't want to be a biblical scholar, I don't want to be a pastor, um, I'm going to be a civil engineer or something instead. Yeah, thank you for that question. Because like, if there's one thing I hope you walk away with from this lecture, I mean, I know it's a lot of words and went through a lot of stuff. Um, if there's one thing I, walk, I would hope you'd walk away is exactly that, to, to like find a way to re-embrace the joy, the playfulness, the freedom mm -hmm. of what it means to read scripture and find a way to recapture like the possibility that God might show up and have something to say to, to you and us, you know? And because as soon as you get sort of really bogged down with, I gotta get the right answer, I gotta like use this to argue my points, I really think you missed the point of why God gave scripture. I think God gave scripture for formation um, and for sort of cultivating community, cultivating your individual holiness. Um, and so, you know, um, how to, and, so I like to teach this class that I teach on history and tradition to just really say like, look, there's so many good, beautiful, faithful ways and the boundaries of how to read are broader than you imagine. And there are boundaries because I, I want to say very clearly, I think another both and we need is both conviction and humility. That's a hard one. Like I don't, I'm not saying be wishy-washy and anything goes. There's, there's, you know, like figuring out your clear convictions and holding those very strongly, but holding them with a gentle grasp because we never know everything, right? Um, so, I, you know, I, this conviction and humility has been a profound thing of I've been approaching scripture in that same way. You know, yes, you can go with your questions and you may have your own convictions and yet having that light grasp of, of realizing, you know, God might surprise us. And, and, and this in terms of boundaries, I think, you know, you, different churches might set various boundaries. I would still encourage, I, and I err on the side of sort of more flexibility with boundaries, but I understand there can be other ways to do it. But like you might think, you know, reading across history, the scripture is Christological, is, is a, a boundary, Trinitarian. You're reading f with, for, and in the church. These are the kind of things that, but within those kinds of broad boundaries, you might d also dig into those. Like, what do we mean by Christological? Do you have just a white Jesus in your head? Mm -hmm. You know, so like even those boundaries have layers to them. Or what do we mean by Trinitarian? Does, is there room for feminist, feminine language of God in the Trinity? Like, so you have all those kind of layers, even within the boundaries that we that might think of that help bound what, what we call Christian reading. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, some of the questions that are coming in are about the ins inspiration of Scripture mm. and the, the spectrum between, you know, every word just dictated down and then like, well, humans, it came through broken humans. And, you know, that's all part of the mess, too. So how does your doctrine of inspiration impact and bring joy to the work that you do in teaching students on how to engage Scripture? Great question. And I feel like that's one I probably haven't thought fully through um, you know, I kind of like, um, like, I'm very sympathetic to say pre-modern readers who really, they do believe in a very, like every word is dictated uh, in scripture kind of thing, but it's not, like I said, tied to this historical facticity or empirical accuracy. So every word's dictated because every word is there, put there, and even the disruptions or seeming inconsistencies or problems in the text are there, intentionally there to help you dig de deeper and think about it. So like that's one way in which you think about this plenary inspiration or this very, and then I'm also really drawn to Karl Barth who kind of says, you know, you, this, God has to show up. And so like just this letter can be a death dealing letter by itself. And, and so I, I have, to, have to admit that I kind of like the both end and, and I'm not, and 
I'm more, it's more important to me to hold on to a robust, life-giving sense of Scripture's authority as sacred text than for me, and this is just me, to exactly define it. And, I, and, and again, so I admit that that's you know, part of what I bring, and other people come with different interests. That's partly a difference between a theologian and a historian, by the mm-hmm. way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Historians kind of want to like, often nail down, let's get the doctrine right, let's get, let's, let's get the articulation exactly right. Historians are always going to come in and say, look, we know it's messy. We know there's so many layers to it. But at the end of the day, I can still hold on to something that I can see that's consistent through time and might have different expressions, and I'm okay with that. But, so. mm-hmm. yeah. One last question from uh, one of our students at the seminary who, who asked about how has the study of the reformers' approach to Scripture blessed your own personal engagement with Scripture? I think I would go there to um, the books I've written kind of are acting out of that question. Mm-hmm. So I found Calvin to be an incredible resource to rethink how to th- um, think about Christological reading of scripture that's not anti-Jewish. Now, let me be clear, Calvin does have his own struggles with anti-Judaism, and I'm not saying he's not anti-Jewish because unfortunately he does have those elements. And yet the way he read Old Testament texts just opened a way to be both Christological while not being anti-Jewish, which was not something that that you see a lot in the early church. You you see an incredible struggle. So that's one of the gifts I had. The other gift comes out of my other book, um, Reformation of Prophecy. Amongst many other things I was trying to do in that book, one of the questions I was struggling with is like, how, if you're not going to, like, how do you think about authoritative um, negotiation? Like, how do you negotiate? negotiate how to think about a good reading. And they try to go back to scripture itself to answer those questions, such as the text in 1 Corinthians 14, where you like, you know, one person stands and, and gives a word and another might come and kind of slightly correct or add. And, and so it's this communal kind of negotiation of reading together and communally discerning the scripture, the spirit and the scripture together, which I just found to be a beautiful, and in doing so, they're trying to answer a big question of their time. Like, how do you allow that to be a communal thing and not a top-down sort of church, um, you know, just the elite of the church making those decisions. Now, they still struggled with it. They didn't have perfect answers, but I was just, it was just powerful and sympathetic to, to see some of the ways they tried to answer those questions. Well, I'm very grateful that you are where you are and teaching as you're teaching, and we have been very blessed by your presence here. So thank you so oh, thank much you. for being with us. Let's yeah. thank our guests today.